I uh, would like to introduce Elizabeth Ashley. Um, so uh, EA is a PhD student at, Vanter, at Vanderbilt University, the Department of Medic uh, Biomedical Informatics. And um, she she's done uh, this work on uh, uh, secure linkage as part of one of the projects she was involved in at, uh, at Vanderbilt. Um, she just presented this work at the AMIA conference uh, last week uh, in Washington, D.C., and it won the Best Student Paper Award. Uh, so quite a competitive uh, uh, award. Um, this, this is clearly uh, an important problem, and I think she's come up with some very interesting uh, solutions uh, to be able to link uh, data sets securely. So with that, I will let uh, EA uh, take over. Hey, thank you for that introduction, Khaled, and thank you for this opportunity to present my research. Khaled mentioned my name is Elizabeth Ashley Durham, and I will be talking today um, about some of my research on privacy preserving record linkage. So I will start out by defining record linkage. So imagine that you have two sets of records, each from a different institution. Here we see an example with a set of records from one hospital, Vanderbilt, and a set of records from a second hospital, Emory. So record linkage is identifying the records that refer to the same individual. Here in this case, we see that two of the record pairs from the different institutions refer to the same individual. So now we'll define privacy-preserving record linkage. This is a variant of the task in which you have the same situation, records at two different institutions, and you'd like to identify the records that refer to the same individual. However, something um, such as a policy prevents you from sharing all of your information. Um, an example of a policy that might prevent such information sharing is the HIPAA policy in the U.S. Um, that prevents healthcare providers from revealing their patient records. So the task here is still to identify records that refer to the same individual but without revealing that individual's identity or compromising their privacy. So one motivation for this research is sharing patient data. So I'll talk a little bit more about this application now. So in the US, the National Institute of Health, or NIH, requires that um, researchers who receive more than half a million dollars in funding a year that they have to develop a data sharing plan. They also require that this information be shared in a de-identified way. Furthermore, the 2007 NIH Genome-Wide Association Studies policy required that researchers funded in any amount for this type of study must share their data. So the kind of rationale behind this is that researchers are funded by the NIH to look at some research problem. They go out and collect this data and that if the NIH can centrally store this data and make it accessible for other researchers, people can benefit from um, making queries to this body of data more generally and won't have to individually go out and do the data collection process so that this can be a shared repository of data that can be used for medical research. However, I'd like to suggest that there's a flaw in the way the current model for de-identified data sharing happens. So here's an example of one kind of error that can be introduced in the current model of de-identified dating sharing, and that's duplicates. So imagine again that you have your two different hospitals, Vanderbilt and Emory. And at each hospital, you have a set of patient records. You have some identifying information, such as first name and last name, and you also have some clinically relevant information, such as diagnosis and outcome. So imagine that you have researchers that would like to look at um, how many people were diagnosed with flu and ended up dying. So if you, um, so now I'll just take a look at how the current model for the identified data sharing happens. So first of all, the researchers de-identify the data. So in this case, they remove the first and last name and just send the cl clinically relevant information to the NIH. The NIH then aggregates that information and stores it in a central repository. However, as we saw on the previous screen, records V1 and E1 actually refer to the same individual, John. So it turns out that the right answer to the question is that two people had flu and died, given this data set. But if you look at the information stored at the NIH, the result would be an overestimate. It would be shown that three people died with flu, um, right, and two of those refer to John. 
So next we'll look at a related flaw, fragmented data. So imagine that John goes to Vanderbilt and is diagnosed with a flu. However, then he leaves and they're not sure about his outcome. John subsequently goes to Emory and dies. However, they're not sure what he had. So this is not an uncommon scenario. Oftentimes patients go to multiple for providers and each provider has a subset of the patient's medical information. So what that looks like when shared is that the identifiers are removed, the clinically relevant information is shared, and when it's aggregated, the NIH, um, the records aren't put together, and so the information is fragmented, and when researchers ask the question, how many people have flu and died, the answer here is one, which is an underestimate of the true answer. So now I'll look at how privacy-preserving record linkage can enable more effective and accurate medical research by, by preventing these kinds of errors. So in this case, privacy-preserving record linkage happens as a precursor to the de-identified data sharing, and it happens like this. Oops, wrong way. So in the first step, um, the hospitals send an encoded form of identifying information to the NIH. Here the encoding is represented as a hash function. So it's encoded in some way so that it's not readable and doesn't compromise patient privacy. However, um, the NIH is still able to perform record linkage on this encoded information, and they make a note of which records refer to the same individuals. The de-identified clinical information is then shared, and the NIH is able to aggregate the data in such a way that they're able to merge the, the records referring to the same person. Here you end up with a clean data set on which you can ask research questions and get accurate answers. So the second application of privacy-preserving record linkage in healthcare is for improving patient care. So imagine that John goes to a hospital to seek treatment. The providers can then issue a query to other hospitals and say, hey, do you have any information on John? Could you please send us his records? This will allow his providers to get a more complete view of John's medical history. Um, this will allow them to provide better care and also to minimize the replication of services. So if John has had some tests at another hospital, they're able to get that information without having to repeat the test. So outside of medical, the medical domain, there are other applications for privacy preserving record linkage as well. One application is in the business setting where you have businesses that like to identify their, com their common clients but out without revealing all of their client lists. The second application is in counterterrorism efforts. So an example um, in this domain is you have the no-fly list of people that have been identified as terrorists and shouldn't be allowed on planes. And those are internationally shared and available. However, um, different countries may not want to share their passenger list. So privacy-preserving record linkage would allow them to identify passengers that are on their passenger list and on the no-fly list without requiring that they reveal their passenger list. So this is just kind of a roadmap for the rest of the talk. Um, we've looked at what record linkage is, what privacy-preserving record linkage is, and some applications for this work. <clears throat> Next, I'll generally describe record linkage and the steps involved. And then we'll look at how we can shift all of that into the privacy-preserving domain. I'll tell you about some work that's been done in the field, and some experiments that we set up and the results we saw, as well as some implications for that work. Then we'll look at some open questions and record linkage and wrap things up. So now we'll take a look at the steps involved in record linkage. <clears throat> record linkage can generally be viewed as a black box where the inputs are sets of records from multiple institutions and the outputs are the set of record pairs that are matches or do refer to the same individual and the set of record pairs that are non-matches or don't refer to the same individual. So in this way, record linkage can be framed as a classification problem. We are trying to classify all record pairs into the set of matches and non-matches. So I make a few assumptions here um, listed at the bottom of the slide. The first assumption is that the institutions sharing data have a common schema. So if one hospital recorded first name and last name only, and the second hospital recorded only social security number, you're not going to be able to do record linkage. So I assume that they have a common schema and also that they have enough information about individuals to 
related to the it's uniquely identifying because if you just have first name, for example, that's not enough information to resolve identity. So you're not going to be able to determine which records refer to an individual, much less multiple records that refer to an individual. Um, I also assume that a common method of data standardization is used. So for example, if they, you'd like to capitalize all the, all the um, letters in the fields or some method for kind of bringing all the data to a common ground on which it can be compared cleanly. And then finally, I assume that records from each institution have been deduplicated. So what that means is that each individual is represented by only a single record within each institution. So now if you kind of peel the lid off of this black box of record linkage, you see that several distinct steps happen in the process. So now I'll take a look at each of those steps, beginning with blocking. So blocking is a method for reducing the computational complexity of record linkage. And I'll show you how that works on this next slide. <clears throat> so um, this will be the data set that we consider for demonstrating what blocking is. And um, again, it's the data set we saw before, but just to refresh your memory, a set of records from Vanderbilt and Emory. And the lines denote record pairs that do refer to the same individual. So <clears throat> when you go to do record linkage, the way it works is you compare each record at Vanderbilt to each record at Emory. So in that case, that results in four times four, or 16 record pair comparisons. Here's this kind of depicted graphically where matches are shown in green and non-matches are shown in red. So all record pairs are considered and then classified as either a match or non-match. Blocking is a method to reduce the computational complexity of this task by making a rough partition of the record pairs and kind of graying out some from consideration as shown here. So here we have an example where the blocking variable is the first letter of the last name. So that means that we're only going to compare records whose last name begins with the same letter. So if we take a look at the first row there, John Smith is only going to be compared to the purple John Smith and Taylor Swift. So <clears throat> the other record pairs are grayed out from consideration and not really examined. So they're classified as non-matches off the bat. We can then do a more fine-grained analysis on the record pairs that we think might be matches that haven't been ruled out in this blocking step and identified those as matches or non-matches as shown. So in this case, we've reduced the number of record pair comparisons that we have to do from 16 down to 5. So the goals of blocking are twofold. The first is obvious to reduce the computational complexity of the task. The second is to maintain the accuracy of record linkage while still reducing the computational complexity. So in this example, if someone's mis last name was misspelled or not there, then you may not con compare the two record pairs that actually are true matches. So you may incorrectly classify it. So maintaining the accuracy while still reducing the computational complexity is the challenge in blocking. So blocking can also be viewed um, in another way. It can be viewed kind of as a space partitioning problem. So you sort the records into these separate buckets based on the blocking variable, which here is the first letter of the last name. And then when, within each of those buckets, you do a mini record linkage. So here we see all records that start who, where the last name starts with the letter S. So here we're going to have to do two record pair comparisons within the S bucket. Here we have the B bucket, where we'll only have to do one record pair comparison. And then finally, in the C bucket, two record pair comparisons will be required. So blocking can also be viewed as a space partitioning problem. And now we'll take a look at the field comparison step in record linkage. So records are composed of multiple fields that contain identifying or quasi-identifying information about individuals. Here we see a sample record pair composed of two fields, first and last name. So one of the records is from one institution and the second from the other institution, and you're examining this record pair to classify it either as a match or a non-match. In the field comparison step, a similarity function is used that takes as input the field values and gives us an output a measure of the similarity of those two field values. So the overall result of the field comparison step is this field comparison vector that contains a measure of the similarity for each of the fields. The next step in record linkage is record pair comparison. So 
What's shown on the screen here is what's already happened so far in the field comparison step. In the record pair comparison step, these field similarities are consolidated into a single record pair similarity score. So inputs to this step are the field comparison vector and some weighting function indicating the importance of some fields over others. And then the output is the single similarity score for the entire record pair. And then the final step in record linkage is record pair classification. <laughs> so in this step, you have all of your record pairs that you've considered and some similarity score that's calculated and associated with each record pair. In the classification step, you actually draw a classifying line and say, record pairs more similar than this we'll call matches, record pairs less similar we'll call non-matches. As far as how you decide where to draw that line, um, the expectation maximization algorithm can provide an estimate of the proportion of record pairs that are true matches. So in this case, you could run the EM algorithm on your record pairs. So you have the four record pairs shown here. And I'll say, I think 25% of the record pairs are true matches. And so you know to draw the line at the top record pair and only call that record pair a match. So in practice, the EM algorithm can provide intuition about where to draw this classification line. And in the experiments I'll show, this is also how we draw the classifying line. So now we'll move into privacy-preserving record linkage and ask how we can move all of these um, steps into the privacy-preserving realm. So I'll start out by giving a bit of background about what's been done in the field so far. And I'll focus in particular on the field comparison and record pair comparison steps. In the experiments I present today, we um, use small data sets, and so we don't use blocking. And then the record pair classification is done based on the estimates of the proportion of record pairs that are matches, as indicated by the EM algorithm, as I discussed a few slides earlier. So now I'll kind of focus on the field comparison and record pair comparison steps. And with respect to field comparison in the privacy-preserving realm, there have been two kind of dominant areas. The first is binary field comparison. So that's where you just get an estimate of whether the fields agree or disagree, but don't get an estimate of the similarity. Um, approximate field comparison metrics, however, do provide an estimate of similarity. So they, in addition to telling you simple agreement or disagreement give you an indication that these fields are, for example, 50% similar. Um, with respect to record pair comparison, Salehi Center is a probabilistic method that has kind of been a dominant uh, method in the field. And I'll give further details on the upcoming slides. However, I would like to mention now that Salehi Center has been designed to work with binary field comparison metrics. Um, therefore, to adapt it to work with approximate field comparison metrics, Phil Winkler at the U.S. Census Bureau introduced a modification, which I will also describe on the upcoming slides. So I will start by illustrating binary field comparison. <clears throat> so again, we have um, a set of records, or a record pair, with multiple fields. And the way that binary field comparison is done in a privacy-preserving way is that these records are sent through some encoding functions, such as a hash algorithm, and you come up with a ciphertext representation of the values in each of the fields. So notice that um, strings that are similar in the plain text, such as um, John and John spelled with a slight typo, end up being very different in the ciphertext space. So you can lose the ability to detect similarity at this point and can only detect binary agreement. So that's what you do here. You just ask, are these values equal? If they're not equal, you assign a zero to the field comparison vector. And if they are identical, you assign a one. So the result of the binary field comparison is this field comparison vector of binary values. So next, we'll look at a way to get a measure of approximate field similarity in a privacy-preserving way. And this research was published in 2009 by Schnell and colleagues. And it makes use of bloom filters to encode each plain text string. So um, Bloom filters are just bit arrays that are initialized to zero, as shown here. And the way that you encode each plain text string is by step one, you break it out into its bigrams, which are just 
strings of size 2, um, and you pad it with spaces on both ends. So you just kind of run a window of size 2 along the string. You then hash each of those bigrams into the bloom filter using multiple hash functions. And then the bits that are hit by these hash functions are set to 1 in the bloom filters as shown. You then use the same hash functions to hash the other bigrams into the bloom filter. And similarly, you encode the other record with the <coughs> same hash functions. So what you end up here is an encoding or ciphertext representation of these plain text strings. These bloom filters can then be compared using a measure such as the dice coefficient, which looks at the number of bits that are set in the intersection of the bloom filters and the number of bits that are set in both bloom filters. So as shown here, we get a measure of the approximate similarity of the strings without having to ever reveal the strings themselves. So now I'll talk about the Flaky Center record pair comparison method. So step one in this method is calculating these conditional probability vectors for each field. And these represent the probability of field agreement given match status. So for example, with the green match vector, you have 0.8 is the probability that first name agrees amongst record pairs that are true matches. Um, in contrast, in the non-match red vector there, you have that 0.05 is the probability that first name randomly happens to agree amongst record pairs that are not true matches. In practice, these conditional probability vectors can be derived one of two ways. The first is using a subset of the record pairs for which the true match status is known to estimate these probability vectors. And the second is to use the expectation maximization, or EM, algorithm to estimate these probabilities. And that's a common, um, or that EM method is commonly used. So once you have these conditional probability vectors, you can derive weight vectors associated with them. And the way you do that is by taking the log of the values associated with the conditional probabilities to get the agreement weight. So this is just a log odds ratio. And similarly, you take the log of 1 minus each of those values to get the disagreement weight. So these conditional probability and weight vectors are calculated once per record linkage over all record pairs. And now I'll show how these can be used in scoring. So just as a reminder, these are the weights that we calculated in the previous slides. You can have them on hand to view throughout the scoring. So here we have a record pair that we're scoring. And as Pelagius Center works with binary field comparison, that's what's applied here. So we see that neither of these fields agree completely, so they're given a similarity of zero. As such, the disagreement weight associated with each field is assigned in the weight vector. These weights are then summed over all fields to get a record pair similarity score for the entire record pair. So, um, so here we see that even though these strings are pretty similar, what's indicated at the end here is that they're completely dissimilar. So the idea is that by using some approximate information about their similarity and including that, we're going to be able to get a better feel for the true similarity of these record pairs and that we'll be able to correctly classify them. So. Bill Winkler introduced a modification to Felicity Center to kind of expand it to work with approximate field similarity metrics, and I will show that here. So the conditional probabilities are calculated just as they were in the previous step. Similarly, the agreement weights are also calculated the same. But rather than just having binary agreement or disagreement, these can be viewed as laying out a scale onto which the field similarities are mapped. So the first name that has zero similarity is given the full disagreement weight. A first name with a complete similarity is given the full agreement weight. But first names with intermediate similarities are mapped onto the scale. Um, and I'll demonstrate how that works now. So here again, we have our record pair that we're comparing. This time, we can use an approximate measure of field similarity, such as the Bloom filter, to get these field similarities shown. So now as we fill in the weight vector, we can go 75% of the way up the scale laid out by first name and see that the value there is 
Similarly with last name, we can go 80% of the way up the scale laid out by the agreement and disagreement weights associated with last name and see that the value there is 1.36. We then sum these weights to get the record pair similarity score for the entire record pair. And so here we see that while this record pair doesn't score as highly as um, a record pair that matches exactly in all fields, it matches a great deal more highly than record pairs that disagree completely. So this gives us a more informative measure of the, of the similarity of the record pair, and we hope that this will allow us to classify it or provide information that can help us classify it more correctly. So to test this hypothesis, we designed the following experiment. The data set we used was the publicly available North Carolina voter registration data set. And this contains about 6 million records. We generated a second data set to which we linked this original by using a data corruptor. Um, so we send each record through the data corruptor, um, and it introduces errors. So this data corruptor is based on the research of Pooja Jono and Christian. It introduces typographical errors, such as insertions, deletions, substitutions, and transpositions. It also introduces phonetic errors, such as PH to F, and optical character recognition errors. So this is characters that look similar to others and are commonly mistaken. These errors are introduced at rates found, um, are commonly found in real data sets. So in addition to these character level errors, we also introduced some token level errors. So um, occasionally we would switch out last name entirely to reflect the practice of changing the last name upon marriage. We would switch out address entirely to reflect people moving from location to location. Um, so in the record shown in the data corruptor here, I've highlighted the errors that have been introduced. We see a deletion in the first name John, and then we see a phonetic error in the last name Smith. Um, we sampled 1,000 records out of the 6 million when we sampled without replacement and ran each of those through the data corruptor. So here what we have is 1,000 record pairs that are true matches. We have 1,000 times 1,000, or 1 million record pairs to consider. So the goal here is to correctly identify the 1,000 record pairs out of the 1 million that refer to the same individual. We then repeated this entire process 100 times so that we could examine the statistical significance of our results. And here we see the fields that have been used in the experiment. Um, these are string-based fields, and none of the fields in and of itself is uniquely identifying. So for example, there's no social security number that should be unique for each individual. So the hope is that in combination, these fields um, will uniquely identify an individual. And then finally, these are the computational resources um, that these experiments were run on. And so now we'll take a look at the experimental results. So we first looked at how accurate the results are, and we measured this by looking at the true positive rate, which is defined at the bottom of the slide, and it's the number of true positives over the number of true positives plus false positives. So um, on the y-axis here, we have the true positive rate, and then we look at each of our different field comparison methods. And as we can see, the approximate uh, field comparison method based on the Bloom filter give a much higher accuracy than the binary field comparison method. Um, this agreed with our hypothesis and was what we were hoping to see. So this is exciting that we can incorporate this approximate matching, excuse me, this approximate field comparison and in a privacy preserving way to achieve higher accuracy and record linkage. Next, we looked at kind of the price we were paying for this increase in accuracy by examining the runtime associated with the two methods. And the runtime is measured in seconds and shown on the y-axis. So as we see, the Bloom filter-based method um, did take a bit longer to run in practice, but not a significant amount of additional time. They're still on the same order of magnitude. And um, just as a reminder, this is over the 1,000 times 1,000 or 1 million record pairs is what we're seeing here. And then standard uh, deviation bars are shown at the top there. So um, what do these results mean? Um, so we looked at two different methods for doing record linkage in a privacy-preserving way. 
We first looked at a method using binary field comparison in conjunction with the Flaky Center algorithm. And we then looked at an approximate field comparison method based on bloom filters in conjunction with Winkler's modification to Pelagi Center. And we saw that by using this approximate field comparison, we were able to achieve higher accuracy and record linkage. However, we did see an additional um, kind of cost and runtime there. Um, a limitation of the study was that this was a pretty controlled environment. So we selected records that where we had all of the fields present. So we, we didn't really throw missing fields into the mix. Um, we also controlled the data corruptor that introduced errors. And so we knew the true, so because we knew the true match status, we were able to um, calculate the conditional probabilities required for the Pelagi Center algorithm exactly. And in practice, these would have to be estimated by a method such as the EM algorithm. So this is kind of a super clean environment, um, a best case scenario where we could examine the differences between these two methods. Okay, and um, next we'll take a look at some open questions and record linkage. So the first of these is enforcing one-to-one -one record linkage. And um, so this problem is associated with a record pair classification step. And as a reminder, the record pair classification step is where you have all of your record pairs and the similarity score associated with each, and you actually draw this classifying line. So the way that we did this was a pretty simple and straightforward way. If we knew that there was supposed to be um, 1,000 true matches, we took the 1,000 record pairs with the highest score and declared them matches or predicted that they were matches. And um, now I'll show you a problem that can be associated with this method in practice. So um, this is the data set I'll use to illustrate this problem. It's similar to the data set we've seen before. I threw out a few records so that things would, wouldn't kind of get too crazy when we start breaking this out into record pairs. And I also added an additional field. So we have the city that each person lives in. And again, the dark lines represent um, the record pairs that refer to the same individual. So um, here we have the set of records from Vanderbilt and the set of records from, X, from Emory. And we've broken this out into all different record pairs. Um, so just as kind of a simple scoring measure here, I use as the score the number of fields that match exactly. So for record pairs, so for example, the top record pair, Clinton and Washington, D.C. match exactly, so it gets a plus two. The third record pair down, none of the fields match, so it gets a zero. So if you're using the method that we used and said, I expect for there to be two true matches in this data set, so I'm going to take the two true, or the two record pairs with the highest scores and classify them as matches, this is the result you'll have. Um, however, if you notice that William Clinton from Emory is involved in two matches. We're saying that William Clinton refers to the same record as Bill Clinton, and William Clinton also refers to the same record as Hillary Clinton. So um, another view of that is shown here. It's predicted that William Clinton corresponds to both Bill and Hillary Clinton. Um, in practice, we see the true matches shown on the bottom half of the graph here. So another way this problem can be illustrated or a way that the record pair classification step can be viewed is that you have your, your record sets and then you have a weighted bipartite graph connecting them where the weights on each edge are the record pair comparison scores. And so the goal here is to kind of maximize the weight um, such that no individual is involved in more than one record pair that's predicted to be a match. And um, just as a reminder, I assumed that the records at each institution had been deduplicated so that each individual is only um, involved in one record at that institution. So, um, right, so what this kind of brings to mind is the stable marriage algorithm. But this is a slight twist on it because we don't want to match each record at the institution. We just want to match up until a certain point. So we know that there are two records two record pairs that are true matches. So we only, kind of like a partial stable marriage problem. So in practice, um, 
this isn't really happening in record linkage. It's kind of not on the radar. So I just wanted to kind of um, present this as an issue. And also, um, I think another reason that it's probably not addressed too often in practice is that you can imagine it's pretty computationally expensive. So adding this step onto the back end of an already computationally intensive task is undesirable in some cases. So this is something that's out there in record linkage and um, right could be a sub, uh, subject for future research. And finally, um, we'll look at decentralized record linkage. So throughout this work, I've kind of assumed a centralized framework in which you had the two institutions sharing their data for record linkage, and they submit an encoded form of their records to a centralized third party who then performs the record linkage. So the centralized third party only receives an encoded form of their records. They never see the plain text, and so in that way, the privacy of the individuals is preserved. Um, and then the results are kind of aggregated centrally by the third party. Um, so we've seen one application for such a centralized setting as the sharing of data for research. However, in practice, there would be some benefits from not depending on this third party for the record linkage. And an example of that is kind of sharing data on the fly between hospitals so that they can get a more complete picture of a patient's medical history. So if a patient shows up in the emergency room and they can quickly pull in the patient's records from other institutions. So that's one application of decentralized record linkage, um, some kind of downsides associated with it or some prerequisites are that that requires that all the hospitals be online and kind of have servers up that can perform this task at all times rather than kind of one-time record linkage that occurs at a centralized location. Um, additionally, so rather than doing a single record linkage that kind of happens at once, you're going to have to do record linkage with each different institution from which you'd like to re retrieve records. So it can be a more computationally expensive task in that case. Um, you're right. Adapting some of the record linkage protocols shown here to work in a decentralized setting is also an open challenge in record linkage research. So now I'll just wrap up. Um, in the centralized setting, we saw that privacy-preserving record linkage can inform and improve medical research. It can provide um, cleaner aggregated data sets on which researchers can ask their questions and get more accurate answers. And then in the decentralized setting, we've seen that privacy-preserving record linkage can improve patient care. In this case, it allows providers to get a more complete view of a patient's history. This can enable them to provide better care and also minimize the replication of services. And these are the works that I referred to throughout my presentation. And finally, I'd like to thank um, Vanderbilt's Department of Biomedical Informatics, for which I'm a member, um, my excellent advisor, Brad Mallon, and two committee members that I've worked closely with, Yuan Shua and Marat Kantarchioglu. Um, also shown are the other Health Information Privacy Lab members, Kathy, Yu, Greg, Ajar, Chaba, and Steve. And I'd like to thank the National Library of Medicine and the National Institutes for Health for funding that's made this research possible. And finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your attendance and time. And I'd think, like to thank Dr. Ella Mom for the opportunity pre to present this research as part of the Electronic Health Information Labs webinar series. Um, so here is my contact information, where you can reach me if you have additional questions, as well as the HIP Lab site. Um, finally, one publication on this research has just been published in the proceedings of the AMIA meeting um, just this month. So the results shown are kind of a subset of a larger study. And when that study has been published, I will send the link to Colette and he can post it for further details as well. So thank you very much for your time. And now I'm happy to take any questions you have. Excellent. Thank you very much, EA. Uh, so um... let me um, stop sharing, and then I can, I think, see and answer your questions. OK, great. OK, so one question um, submitted is, how do you give weight to different attributes to compute similarity score? 
That's a great question, and the answer to that question is that that's an implicit part of the Falaki Center algorithm. So um, if you recall, you estimate those conditional probabilities associated with each field, and those, associate, those conditional probabilities are then converted into weights um, by taking the log odds ratio. So uh, fields that have a high probability of matching or fields that have a high probability of agreeing amongst record pairs that are matches are going to implicitly get a higher weight associated with them. So when you sum across those weights, the more informative fields are going to be contributing to a greater extent um, to the overall sum. Okay. And um, another question I see is, how do you compare approximate distance for non-string fields? And that's also a great question. So um, the field comparison method that I showed here was based on bloom filters. And that's a pretty versatile method in that it can be applied to um, both numerical and string-based fields. So this one is applicable for both and in um, other experiments. In the AMIA paper listed, we compared um, string-based fields such as social security number and telephone number, zip code, with this method and saw good results. Um, as I mentioned, this is a subset of larger work in which we um, evaluated other approximate privacy-preserving field comparison metrics as well. And some of them are only applicable for string-based fields. Some are applicable for non-string-based fields, um, numerical fields. Um, but the Bloom filter approach that I demonstrated um, can, can compare both fields. So, just an example, there are some phonetic filtering methods that are only applicable for string-based fields. And then there are some methods for calculating the difference between two numerical fields based on secret sharing. So they can calculate the difference in a privacy-preserving way. So different methods for different field values. And then um, another question I see is, how can you deal with people using their nicknames? So there are a couple of ways that that can be dealt with. One way is through the use of an approximate field comparison method, such as the bloom filter method. So often nicknames um, are kind of a subset of the full name. So Beth is part of Elizabeth. And so you'll see that those same bigrams are in the going to be hashed into the bloom filter. And we use the dice coefficient. You'll catch that those Elizabeth and Beth are maybe 40% similar or something like that. Another way to deal with that is to kind of deal with that on the front end in a pre-processing step. So before these strings are encoded and sent off for record linkage, um, I mentioned that there's kind of a data standardization and pre-processing step. So there's some nickname databases that are available. So you could run all of your strings through there and have some um, kind of heuristic, like you're going to convert all nicknames to their full name. So anytime you see Beth, you're going to replace it with Elizabeth, um, and so on and so forth. So you can use some um, pre-processing steps like that on the front end. Um, there are some kind of pros and cons associated with that. If you convert all Beth to Elizabeth, maybe Beth goes by Beth everywhere she goes. So you're kind of taking um, things from a more diverse space and projecting them down into a less rich space. And, you may be losing some information there and kind of losing the ability to distinguish. But um, that's one way it can be dealt with as well. And then let's see what else. Um, another question as I see, do you need a semi-trusted third party to implement this so that the two sources do not need to share data? Yeah, so I, I kind of touched on that when um, looking at the centralized versus decentralized record linkage application. So in the centralized, you do need a third party um, so that the two sources don't share data. There are protocols um, that don't rely on a centralized third party. So one method that's coming to mind is a secure version of edit distance. And um, so edit distance is commonly uh, calculated through a dynamic programming algorithm that relies on these matrices, and you kind of work your way up through the matrix, and at the end, get the minimal edit distance between the two strings. And um, this is 
uh, kind of take a step back, edit distance is the minimal number of insertions, deletions, or substitutions required to convert one string to another. So um, to write that dynamic programming matrix is held jointly between the two parties sharing data and kind of calculated iteratively um, so that neither is able to see the entire matrix, only a portion of it. And they use homomorphic encryption to sum the values at the end and calculate the edit distance between their two fields. So there are some pretty cool protocols like that. In practice, we found that um, that one was not particularly computationally efficient. So for example, on the 1,000 by 1,000 record pairs um, that we did linkage or records that we did linkage on in these experiments, that would take over two years to calculate using this edit distance protocol. So, so um, doing this decentralized um, format in a way that's computationally realistic and feasible is still kind of an open challenge, and I think that's another reason that decentralized record linkage hasn't really taken off. And let's see. Okay. Um, so the next question is, in many systems nowadays, most of the information is selected from lists and not entered by users except data like first name and last name. Does this limit the difference only to those fields? Um, let me read that one more time to make sure I'm understanding it. Okay, I see. So, um, <clears throat> so you're thinking of data where you kind of have a drop-down menu and can select values like a list of possible states to enter into your address. So, um, so yeah, I think that that's helpful as far as record linkage goes because you kind of restrict your input to a subset of kind of all possible inputs that you know do correspond to real states. So if I was entering my state as Georgia and I had a typo and instead of typing GA, the abbreviation for Georgia, I typed FA um, in a kind of system where inputs aren't regulated, that could get by, and in a system where inputs are regulated, there would be some error correction um, to ensure that my state was entered correctly. So I think that that's a good thing for record linkage, and um, that kind of, even if that's not enforced at the time of data entry, if that can be used as part of a pre-processing, excuse me, a pre-processing step for record linkage, so you go through and say, these are my legitimate state abbreviations, and I'm going to either make sure that I'm going to kind of throw out abbreviations that don't fall into the set of reasonable real-world states. Um, I think that that'll be cleaning up the data set and kind of allowing you to get a clear picture of that similarity of the field. I hope that I answered that question adequately. And the next question is an easy one. Will these slides be available after the webinar? And the answer is yes. Um, Dr. Alamon's group should be posting those within the next few days. And let me see if I'm missing any others here. I think I've answered all the questions that have been submitted. Are there any other questions? Um, I think that might be it. Okay, well, if not, thank you very much for your time and attention. Please feel free to email me if additional questions do come up down the road, if you're interested in further details um, once some of this work has been published. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Yay. This is really great work. Um, and uh, uh, w one last just point I wanted I wanted to, to ask you, I think, for, for everybody. When do you think the, the uh, remainder of the work will be published and made available, the, the parts that deal with the... Uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, linking, for example, because you mentioned a couple of pieces of future work, and uh, when do you think that would that material would be would be out? Right. Um, so a larger evaluation of six different approximate field comparison metrics is under review at the moment. Um, hopefully, that'll be out quite soon. Um, as far as the one-to-one -one linkage and uh, decentralized work, I haven't begun that work yet. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, right. So that's a good question, <laughs> and I don't especially um, have the answer. 
I wasn't, these aren't necessarily kind of next items on my research list, but just kind of introducing some open challenges and record linkage. Um, so, so right, the one-to-one -one linkage, I have not had an opportunity to really focus on yet. The decentralized linkage, um, that should be, that's addressed in work that'll be published um, shortly. It's been submitted, so, so hopefully not too long. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for attending, and you'll receive an email hopefully in the next 24 hours with uh, the link to where the recording will be and the uh, uh, slides as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.